the legends speak of a beast of an unholy creation. A terrifying monster that emerges from the dark. A union between the man and the... <laughs> the wolf? Werewolves are, without a doubt, some of the most famous monsters and a real threat to any Red Riding Hood that goes into the forest. Hello, Grandma. I've brought medicine. It is time to dive deep into the lore behind the werewolves and show you how to defeat this wolven threat. But the true monster hunter must learn a few things beyond the choice of weapons and protective measures. In order to properly fight a werewolf, one must strive to understand and to know his enemy. That means we must first talk about the wolves, and there is a lot to talk about. Since the dawn of civilization, wolves enjoyed a rather unflattering reputation. Even in one of the oldest written sources, they are portrayed as an enemy of men. In the stories about Gilgamesh, we encounter not only a very early reference to the wolf, but also a description of a transformation between human and animal. In the story, Gilgamesh refuses the advances of Ishtar, a goddess of war, beauty, justice, fertility and sex. Basically, a woman who takes what she wants, or she will make you submit under her boot. Someone's naughty dream, for sure, but Gilgamesh turned her down by mentioning a story of a shepherd who was turned into a wolf by Ishtar who grew unhappy with her lover. The poor fellow was chased by his own helpers and torn apart by his own dogs. A typical quarrel between lovers, isn't it? It is no coincidence that Ishtar turned the shepherd into a wolf. She changed him into the very predator from which he protected his flock. This short story shows how the relations between humans and wolves would develop for ages to come. With the rise of animal husbandry, the predators which preyed upon the cattle, sheep and goats became the worst enemy of shepherds. Thus, the wolf became an almost universally accepted symbol of an evil force that strives to rob the hard-working folk of their livelihood, not simply just eat them. A wolf is, after all, a predator that is completely capable of hunting a human-sized prey with ease, though it must be stated that a wolf is a pretty shy animal and under normal circumstances avoids getting too close to humans. While a single wolf isn't a big problem, they rarely travel alone. A wolf pack can consist of up to over 30 animals, but when the food is scarce, for example during harsh winters, these animals can form bigger hunting groups that allow them to hunt bigger prey. If we were to travel back to the first half of the 15th century France, we would witness Paris in a rather poor condition. A hundred years war, a drop in temperature known as the Little Ice Age, and a series of severe winters brought something more than hunger and despair to the heart of France. Wolves. According to the story, between 1421 and 1439, the wolves became so bold that they were able to enter Paris by walking over the frozen Seine into the city, or to slip through the culverts to bypass the walls. Paris was a rich hunting ground with plenty of meat lying just beneath the ground. Instead of chasing the citizens, the wolves were digging out corpses of recently deceased people. The most famous part of the story concerns a pack of predators under a leadership of a red-furred wolf nicknamed Kortold, which literally means bobtail. In 4039, Parisians were hoping that throwing the corpses of plague victims outside of city walls will infect the wolves and thus the problem will solve itself. There is no way such a masterful plan would backfire. Or is there? The wolves became accustomed to man flesh and in the ravaged countryside it was an easily available delicacy. Courtauld and his pack were able to disrupt the vigil dedicated to Saint Mary and kill dozens of clergymen at the steps of the Notre Dame Cathedral. Courtauld became the bane of Paris, but in the end the citizens were able to lure the wolf pack into the city 
and kill the man-eating predators after a pitched battle. This story could have been embellished, but it portrays the dangers and circumstances of many wolf attacks as described in historic sources. Also, it wasn't the last time when French people were dealing with bloodthirsty creatures in their country. If the wolves were absent, there were plenty of Englishmen to deal with, but the latter are beyond the scope of my services. But let us return to the wolves. Many cultures draw a very thin line between a common animal and a supernatural being. Early rabbinic and Christian literature often described animals as vessels for demons. The clear signs of possession were enormous strength, aggressive behavior and frothing at the mouth, as described by Saint Hieronymus in his story about Saint Hilarion and a possessed Bactrian camel. Nowadays, we can say that such examples are in fact describing rabies among the cattle. Among the creatures that enjoy the rather dubious honor of being treated as hellspawns, we mostly find predators and animals capable of emitting unusual scary noises. Thus, jackals, hyenas, crows, snakes, owls and wolves were the prime examples of demonic presence to the people adhering to Christian and Hebrew creed. Origen of Alexandria, an early and very influential Christian theologian, was speaking very poorly about animals, discrediting polytheistic beliefs that viewed various creatures as messengers from the gods. Origen described snakes, foxes and, of course, wolves as wretched beings that exist only for the detriment of man. In the New Testament, animals representing the forces of evil dwindled somehow and formed an unholy trinity. A snake, which evolved into a long serpent-like dragon, a lion, which was a bit problematic because it could also symbolize Christ, and of course, the wolf. What animal was better suited for the role of devil's emissary than the wolf? A predator that preyed upon sheep was a perfect enemy from the viewpoint of Christianity, both factually and symbolically. So there is little surprise in the way Christianity depicted wolves. But Christianity wasn't the only belief that demonized the wolf. In Finnish mythology, the wolf was created by Syrjata, a malevolent being credited with giving birth to diseases and creating unpleasant or useless creatures like serpents, lizards and wolves. Zoroastrians treated wolves even more harshly as an animal made out of darkness by the evil Ariman and the wolf's cruelty knew no bounds. In Hindu mythology, wolves are used by Krishna to force people to leave their city and also represent the insatiable appetite. However, not every religion treated wolves as evil incarnate. Though Norse mythology is famous for the trio of antagonistic wolves in the form of Fenrir, the bane of Odin, Skull and Hati, which chased after the sun and moon respectively, wolves also represented bravery, loyalty, protection and wisdom. Odin himself was accompanied by a pair of these animals, namely Geri and Freki, and Germanic people introduced a handful of wolf-related names like Wolfgang and Rudolf. But Scandinavians weren't alone in holding these animals in high regard. The Romans generally refrained from intentionally harming this animal, as it was a symbol of the eternal city, and wearing a wolf's skin was considered a great honor. It is no coincidence that the Roman flag bearers were adorned in such a fashion. Nomads like Mongols and Turkic people, as well as native inhabitants of North America like Pony, Deneina or Tlingit, associated wolves with courage, strength and proficiency during the hunt, and rightfully so. A group of hunters was akin to a wolf pack and there was a fair share of respect coming from humans towards their animal counterparts. There is a visible difference in treatment of wolves between monotheistic and polytheistic beliefs. Christianity is the best example of demonizing those animals and creating an aura of fear and hatred towards the wolves. A wolf in sheep's clothing. A wolf in sheep's clothing as a metaphor for the devil is probably the best way of summarizing the way Christians looked upon the wolf and by the extension, upon the idea of humans turning into such an animal. 
For Anglo-Saxons living in a pastoral society where wealth was built around sheep and wool trade, the wolf was indeed a beast of battle, a prowling spectre stalking the pious and the flocks. Another example from Anglo-Saxon England comes in the form of Wolfes Hefod, which means wolf's head. It was a term used with regard to an outlaw who could be killed as a wolf, without warning, trial or mercy. A similar occurrence can be seen centuries earlier in Asia Minor. In Hittite law, criminal offense was punished with banishment and the outlawed man was described as a wolf. Common fairy tales like Little Red Riding Hood, The Three Little Pigs, The Boy Who Cried Wolf or even the modern movies like The Grey are showcasing that even in modern day a wolf is perceived as, well, a big bad wolf. It doesn't mean that in polytheistic beliefs the wolf was treated without fear and distrust. The best example of that is the Finnish mythology and the Greek myth about King Lycaon. But generally speaking, the animals were considered a part of a bigger world, a piece of a larger puzzle, if you may say so. The wolf was a messenger from gods and spirits, protector of the forest, an omen, be it good or bad. Sometimes it was preying upon the cattle and their owners, but as long as there were enough forests and wild game, the wolves didn't have any good reason to go out of the way to interact with man. But that didn't mean the man was going to do the same. The existence of werewolves is tightly related to stories about wolf attacks and the presence of rabies. The virus is, of course, a prime suspect when talking about werewolves, but there is one last sinister machination that cemented the picture of a wolf as an enemy of civilization itself. Money. Sadly, an animal can be sacred as long as it doesn't get in the way of profits. In terms of wolves, there is no better example than Japan. For centuries, wolves were worshipped as benevolent messengers from gods and protectors of farmers. Even their name focuses on supernatural ties, since the Japanese word for wolf is okami, literally a great deity. For Japanese farmers, wild boar and deer were a threat to crops, and so they erected many shrines in honor of an animal that helped to keep their fields safe. In a country without big livestock industry, the wolf was an ally of the farmers. In the 18th century, the wolf's habitat was shrinking because of the human expansion and the seeds of hatred were sown. Just like with the Anglo-Saxons and their sheep, the presence of wolves in Japan was becoming an irritating nuisance to the former worshippers. The spread of rabies wasn't doing wolves any favors either. First bounties have been issued on wolves' heads. With the dawn of Meiji era and rapid westernization of the country, it became clear that there was no place for the wolves in modern Japan. Quite literally. In 1873, the Meiji government hired Edwin Dunn and tasked him with modernizing the Japanese agriculture. He accomplished his task with utmost thoroughness. But clearing the land for more crops, pigs, cows and horses required cutting down the centuries-old forests. For the burgeoning Japanese livestock industry, the wolf was a problem, and Edwin Dunn knew how to solve it. With money and poison. Strychnine, to be exact. By the 1905, there were no more wolves in Japan. In the span of 32 years, the wolf was turned from deity into demon standing in the way of modernization. An extinct demon. You might be wondering, why is the history of a wolf so important in the context of werewolves? In myths, stories, religion and folklore, changing into an animal was equal to adopting traits of said animal. If the wolf was considered evil incarnate, a werewolf will be a combination of the worst traits of human and a wolf. Case in point, Wolf of Ansbach. In 1685, a lone wolf began attacking livestock in the principality of Ansbach, but soon he grew an appetite for much more accessible prey, human children. Because of that, the citizens of Ansbach believed it wasn't an ordinary animal, it was a werewolf a reincarnation of a cruel and recently deceased Burgmeister, mayor, in other words, 
who has risen from his grave to exact revenge upon his subjects. The werewolf was finally slain, and his body was paraded through the streets. But it wasn't the end of the story. Since it wasn't a common predator, it wouldn't do to simply bury or leave it to rot. The muzzle of the animal was cut so that a mask could be fitted upon its head. The wolf of Ansbach was dressed in clothes, wig, beard, so that it would look like the cruel Burgmeister. After all these macabre preparations, the werewolf was hanged from a gibbet. It is impossible to talk about wolves and werewolves without mentioning the Scandinavian warriors, who charged into battle screaming and howling, ignoring the wounds and slaying their enemies in a bloody rage. The Ulfhednar. Though Scandinavian warriors weren't the first to consider themselves wolves, they are without a doubt the best known. The idea of the warrior hunter bands which identified themselves with wolves or dogs is believed to harken back to the Proto-Indo-European mythology. Lycanthropy in this context is believed to be a part of an initiation ritual. It is no coincidence that a group of young, armed men, often living as mercenaries or raiders, were compared to the wolves in many different cultures and eras, as stated in the Encyclopedia of Indo-European Culture, edited by Mallory and Adams. Irish Fianna, Werewolves of Ossery, Spartan Cryptea, Practice of Ver Sacrum by Italic People, Athenian Ephebea, Warrior Bands in Vedic Tradition and, of course, Scandinavian Vikings were all connected to the same root called Koryos. Roughly speaking, the Proto-Indo-European word Koryos denoted a group of young people, mostly from upper classes of society, that passed painful trials and rituals in order to join a brotherhood of warriors. Such a group was expelled for a few years from society and was forced to live by fighting, hunting, stealing, raiding and looting everyone who had the misfortune of being close to this pack. One of the defining characteristics of Corios was the connection to the wolves and dogs, ecstatic rituals, battle frenzy, attacking like animals, often in the dark, violence, disregard for wounds and a belief that the members of the Brotherhood were gifted with the wolves or dogs attributes were attested from India to Ireland. It is no coincidence that Hittites dubbed outlaws as wolves, while Avestan literature described members of the warband as wolves or dogs. In Greece, the young males under the patronage of Apollo were given the epithet Lycaeus, namely wolf-like, and the Irish mythical hero Setanta during his initiation was given the name Kukulain, the Hound of Kulan, and last but not least, we have the Norse Ulfhedna literally wolf-skinned. Fierce warriors driven by frenzy and a belief that they were indeed transformed into a wolf, meant to wreak havoc and tear down any man that would be foolish enough to cross their path. With the introduction out of the way, next time we will talk about the werewolves and the methods used to deal with such creatures. Thank you for listening and I hope to see you next time.